promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, in Him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing His praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. How to store and sort all your photos and videos in seconds. Okay, again, welcome to uh, our class on establishing biblical authority. Uh, today, uh, we're again finishing uh, one class and preparing uh, for the next. I will say if you haven't downloaded the PDF from this class, uh, you might want to do that. It's at the bottom now of our live meeting page. Uh, because we're going to be taking this uh, booklet off. We have already put information about the new class. Uh, we do want to make a quick announcement, and we want everybody to understand that there will not be a live meeting class next Monday, February the 27th. Uh, this will be a day of review and I have a picture there of page 51 out of our study, uh, which is lesson 12. We're at lesson 11 today. Lesson 12 is an overview of the various principles, precepts that we have covered uh, in this class. And we encourage the student to go back and review all of this through lesson 12. It is intended to uh, each student to sit down and consider the things which lesson 12 has to say. 
and that should be applied to us first and then to our various congregations. We need to consider what our attitude is towards the concept of establishing biblical authority. And so please uh, take the time, uh, if you've set this time apart, and you should have, uh, please next Monday spend some time with your Bible and your notebook and contemplate the things that are being taught or overviewed, reviewed, uh, in Lesson 12. But we are excited to announce the fact that uh, our new class, our certificate program, will begin on March 6th, 2023. It is open to all students who are willing to uh, follow the class, do the class work, up until this point, we have not required the students who are watching to send in answers to the various questions, and that will change. If you're wanting to be a part of the uh, certificate program and you want a certificate of completion, successful completion, then uh, you will need to complete the 27-week study. Uh, submit the questions as they are required, and there will be some extra work that will be assigned along the way. Uh, if you're interested in that and have not already signed up, uh, we have our email there, ChristWayBible at gmail.com. Send your name, mailing address, email, uh, so Brother Stanley can uh, get in touch with you and make sure that you're ready for the class to begin on March 6th. Uh, some questions that came up, and I want to clarify this. You do not have to be a registered student to attend this class. Uh, that is the one that's coming up. Uh, there's been some confusion if, if you don't register uh, are we not going to be able to take the class? If you're not a registered student, nothing will change for you. Uh, go onto our live meetings page, download uh, the class notes, and we will spend time. And you're welcome to uh, go over that just as we have been doing. Uh, however, uh, no certificate will be provided. Uh, if you do not register and complete the course requirements. But if you just want to audit or listen uh, to the lessons as they're being presented, feel free to be our guest uh, and to learn informally. But if you want to be a formal student of Christway Bible Institute and earn the certificate of completion, you will need to register. Okay, with all of those announcements made, uh, we're going into lesson 11, which is the final uh, class lesson. And today we're going to be talking on the subject matter of expedients, aids, and optionals in the commands of God and how they're used uh, correctly. Uh, lots of people use what are called expedients, aids, or optionals, but they may use them in a way uh, which conflicts with something that is being taught. It may add to uh, the teachings in a way that violates uh, the authority granted us in the scriptures, and we'll address that as we go along here this morning. The scripture that was read come from Matthew 15, and I'm sure that most of us are familiar with that, uh, where Jesus said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, 
teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. As we enter this discussion of expedients, aids, and optionals, we need to understand that they are just that, and they should not be considered on the same level as a command issued by God. Jesus was attacked here in this section of Matthew uh, because his disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. Now, he is not uh, being uh, confronted because of cleanliness as far as washing dirty hands, was talking about a tradition that had been established. And this did not come directly from the scripture, but it was something that uh, had been added in uh, to facilitate a better understanding of one's separation from the world. But they had taken this uh, optional item, made it a command, and therefore made it a condition of fellowship. So we have to be careful that we are not violating the scriptures or adding to and taking away, uh, because Jesus says to do so is to worship and to serve him uh, in vain, putting more emphasis on the teachings of men than the commandments of God. As we begin this morning, let's ask a simple question. What is an expedient? The word expedient comes from another word, expedite. And the word expedite and expedient is something that uh, helps us to complete a given task, uh, helps us to carry out a command. Uh, it uses what most of the time we would call common sense wisdom to carry that out. The example we have is God gives us a command to go preach the gospel. Now, a person may walk uh, to go preach the gospel. If you live in a community and the congregation, the meeting house where you live is just a couple hundred feet away, then you may walk to worship and your legs do the work. And again, you complete God's uh, command to go and preach, especially in your own congregation. But on the other hand, if the congregation or where you're going to preach is a great distance away, walking is not perhaps the best way to go. And so it might be wiser to drive a car or a scooter or some other means of transportation to get there. And that car, that scooter, the other means of transportation becomes the thing which expedites or becomes an expedient to the original command to go. Uh, and whether one walks, whether one drives their own car or scooter, takes a train, or if it's a real long distance, a plane, uh, they are carrying out the command of God to go. And these uh, implements that we have uh, just tend to expedite the command. Now, uh, they grow. The use of an expedient comes from the fact that God has given us a command. And we have talked about generic and specific commands. Uh, and when we have a generic command, which does not go into specific details, then all aids and methods and modes and manners, which are helpful uh, to that generic command, are lawful or they are permitted and they may be used as an expedient. 
However, if God gives us a specific command asking for a specific thing to be done, then we cannot replace what God has commanded with something that we feel is just as good or better. That would be a violation of God's commandment. And so the idea of to go preach the gospel is a generic command. And since God gave us no specific means, and at that time they could have used a camel, they could have used a donkey, they could have had an ox cart they traveled in, they could went by ship, but Jesus did not give a specific way to go. The reason being that he expected the apostles and disciples, as well as us today, to use uh, our common sense and to use whatever aid we can find that will help us uh, to fulfill, whether that is walking or to the extent of taking a airplane, depending on where we're going. Let's look at this specific command that God gives. Now, the generic command was to go preach the gospel. Let's look at a more specific command and see the difference between a generic command on one hand and a specific command on another. In the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we find the commandment there to sing to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. The kind of music that God wants us to use is specified, and that is singing. The type of music God wants us to use is specified, and therefore we cannot change that. However, there are aids, there are what we would call expedients to that, that help us to keep that command. And so let's consider some of those things. For example, uh, an expedient would be uh, singing in soprano. If our congregation is not greatly skilled, uh, in singing at first, it might be best if all people sing the same part, for example, such as soprano. In the early days of the church, we find that uh, they sung in what was called monophonic plain song. Now, that's a big fancy word, but if you've heard a Gregorian chant, that was somewhat the way in which the early church practiced singing with a chant. Over a period of time, we have added to that and we have separated uh, into even what we now call four-part harmony. Four-part harmony, again, gives a different feeling to a song, but it does not change the specific command. Our voices will be used in different ways, whether that's soprano or whether it's bass, uh, whether it's tenor or one of the other ways in which we can accomplish that. And so learning four-part harmony would be an expedient to singing with our uh, voices, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Uh, a song leader... I mean, we most of the time believe that, again, an expedient would be having someone lead the singing, choose the songs, lead the singing, and we follow along. And so the song leader does not violate God's law to sing, and therefore we can have a song leader. We can have song books. Some congregations, larger congregations, due to the expense of printed songbooks, have chosen to use their projector 
and project the songs on a board in the front of the auditorium where all can see, and therefore they no longer use what we would think of as a songbook. And so the projector and the PowerPoint slides or whatever they're using uh, replaces the songbook. And all of these things are expedients to help someone fulfill the command of God to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. But let us again emphasize, and we're going to keep doing this, an expedient, an aid, something deemed optional, must not and should not violate the original command. For example, once again, we're back to sing. The kind of music is specified. We are to sing. Uh, again, we've talked about the four-part harmony, the chant, whatever that is. But here's a question that comes up sometimes when we're dealing with the religious world and even some in our brotherhood. Is a mechanical instrument, such as a piano, a guitar, drums, whatever, could not that also be considered an expedient to the command to sing? And so some believe that the piano is nothing but an expedient aid or optional. It's okay if you don't have one, and it's okay if you have one. And the difference in using a mechanical instrument is that that instrument supplies music. It supplies a different kind of music. And while indeed it may be an expedient in the sense that some think it helps them to sing better, it is a violation of God's command. It adds something beyond just assisting or aiding it, and it changes the very nature of the command. And so by adding a piano, a guitar, uh, those things to the singing, we now have vocal music and we have instrumental music. And that would be like going ahead and adding a third item to the Lord's table. Uh, you know, we're told that when Jesus was crucified, there came out of his side both blood and water. Again, on the communion table, we have the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, the unleavened bread, which represents his body. Let's ask ourselves, maybe it would help us to better understand that if we would also add water to the communion table because there was water and blood that came from the Lord's side. Now, while that might help us to understand about the blood and water that flowed from his side, it is not something that is commanded, and therefore it changes what Jesus' example was and what we see the early church doing. We have warnings throughout the scriptures, especially Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Revelation 22, 18, and 19, about adding or taking away from the scriptures. And so when we're adding an aid or using an aid, we need to make sure that we're not changing the original generic command that God gave us when we're using that. And we need to also understand that in a specific command, uh, you know, we have to do whatever it is directly that we were commanded to do. Aids are the same thing as an expedient. 
Uh, the word expedient is what I call a $5 word. Uh, and so some people, uh, it's easier for them to talk about it in the sense of an aid, that which aids us in fulfilling our responsibility. And as such, we can say that a songbook aids the worshiper in singing the song by guiding them in both the words and the harmony or melody that they are using in the worship of God. The song leader aids in choosing the songs, helping to set the proper pitch for the song to have it in tune, but his leading the song does not change the fact that he is merely another part of the congregation who's singing. We just take our cues from one person who is singing and we follow along. So that does not change anything. In some congregations, they will put the numbers of the song from the songbook on the wall to aid people in knowing which songs we're going to be singing at any given time. That does not change anything about singing. It just merely provides an aid to the worshiper who comes and sits down. They can take out their songbook even before worship starts, look over the songs that we're going to be singing, perhaps think about it, meditate about it, and better be prepared to sing. <clears throat> it helps us to, to know many things, but it does not change the original command with the specifics of making melody in our hearts to sing. We were not commanded to sing and to play. This aid does not change the act of singing, and that's what we want to understand. Let's look at this in the concept or the perspective of God's commands to Noah. Noah was told of God to build an ark of gopher wood. He was given specific dimensions, the length, the width, how many stories that it was supposed to be in uh, the construction. That was what God gave him. He gave him the length, the width, the height. He told him, build it out of gopher wood to pitch it within and without. But there was a lot of things that in that command, God did not specify. It is apparent that he had to get the wood somehow. Now, whether he paid people to go and cut the wood, uh, he paid them to form the wood, or whether he went and cut the wood himself, none of that changes the specific command if the wood is gopher wood. And as he constructs the ark, he is free to use a hammer, saw, nails, wooden pegs, a fire to melt the pitch, uh, and he can build that ark. And in all of those things, he has fulfilled God's command and did fulfill it because he built an ark out of gopher wood to the length, width, and height pitched within and without, uh, specifically as God told him. And in using various implements, aids, expedients, various things were optional. Uh, where would we use wood pegs? Would we use metal nails? Uh, you know, how will we do this? Will we notch the wood? Uh, will we add nails to it? Uh, those things were not specified, and thus Noah and his sons and whoever may have helped him were free to build the ark according to that so long as they did not violate. That is, they did not make the ark longer because they felt they needed more room or add an extra story. That would be a violation. 
if Noah used wood other than gopher wood, uh, even if he thought that wood was better than gopher wood or just as good as gopher wood, he would have been in violation of God's specific command to build the ark of gopher wood. And so we have to be able to distinguish the difference between when we are keeping God's commands and when we have crossed the line and are in a position or a place where we're no longer keeping the original command as given, but we have changed that and we have substituted a new law in essence for the one given of God. Now I realize it takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of time to understand this. And this is a problem in the brotherhood of understanding that expedience, aids, and options are not law. They are a means to an end, and that is the fulfilling of the original law. And so we should never attempt to make these aids, expedients, and things which are optional a command and believe that if others don't do it exactly this way, then they're sinning. As I said, I don't believe that Jesus had an issue, and he really didn't even address in Matthew 15 the fact that the washing of hands, whether it was or wasn't, something they should do. I think Jesus, uh, you know, and again, it's my opinion, but you know, he did not address that, but he addressed weightier matters where they were changing the law. The law says this, and you're doing this, and you're saying this is as good as that, and in vain you worship me. And so we must know what the generic or specific command is. If it's specific, we must do as God has commanded us without violating that command. If it is generic, then we can add the expedients, the aids, the optionals, so long as it does not change the generic command. And so we should take some time and practice asking what makes this an expedient, and what makes that a violation of God's law. And until we as the body of Christ can understand this lesson, there's going to be divisions. There's going to be divisions because people, uh, without having truly considered this, uh, go beyond or fall short of what the original command was. As we've already said, we're commanded to sing. That is the command, sing. Uh, not play, sing. And so, as we've said, instrumental music is a violation of that, while the songbook isn't. And this is at the very heart when many people say, well, you've changed the worship of the church and how do we know that the worship of the church is acceptable? And they'll say, well, originally uh, they lit the place of worship with an oil lamp and you're using an electric light bulb. What makes that not a violation? Uh, you know, churches have pews. People have built church buildings. The early church didn't even have a church building. And so we have people today who argue that we shouldn't have church buildings at all because the early church didn't have such a thing as a church building. They met in people's houses, and it was much later before Christians began to build church buildings. And if you can't distinguish the difference between a true aid, expedient, an option from a violation of God's law. We will never be able to 
see things a little bit differently, what may be best for me and what may be best for you may be slightly different, but that doesn't mean that either one of us are violating God's law. But if we go beyond or come short, then most certainly we are. And optionals are just that. Uh, since the command is generic, general, then we do not have specifics, and therefore we may use, as we've already said, various options to address that. We may have, if there's just five or six of us meeting in someone's house as the church, we may just have a small photocopied booklet of songs that we sing as we save up money to buy a songbook. And that's fine. In other congregations, they may have songbooks and the PowerPoint presentation or various means. All of these things are optional and we don't necessarily have to have them. Now, here's the statement, and I know it can be confusing. All optionals within the realm of that generic command can be seen as an expedient, but not every optional necessarily can be an expedient. And I don't want to confuse people, but, but let me uh, address this. I get this all the time. We have individuals who there's five people meeting as a church. And they start soliciting. They want money to build a church building and to buy songbooks. They want a, a PowerPoint projector. Uh, they want to have microphones and amplifiers, and there's just five people meeting in a living room. All of these things that they're requesting are optionals, and they can be used, but at the same time, these options may not be expedient for these people. They do not have really enough in attendance to justify building a separate meeting place. Five people sitting in a living room do not need microphones and amplifiers. Five people in a very small congregation with little finances do not need to be doing PowerPoint presentations off of expensive computers unless they already have those things. And so a lot of people believe that in order to be a faithful church, you know, they have to build them a very good building. They have to have all of these things and they miss the point. All of these things are optionals they are not commands. They are aids to the worship of God, but none of them are commanded. Yes, we can have a church building, and yes, we can meet in members' houses. The Bible does not give us a specific command as to where we're to meet, it doesn't command that every congregation must have its own church building. It doesn't give us commandments on all of these things. And so I'm afraid that many of our brotherhood, having seen the way in which many of the larger churches operate, believe they can't be a real church until they get their building and they get their PowerPoint and they get their microphone, and they get their pews, uh, and this is wrong. This is going to take a considerable amount of finances, which they do not have, 
and they could better use in evangelism and reaching the lost. And therefore, even though all of those things are acceptable, even though they are expedients and they're options, uh, it's not necessarily a good fit for them. And so there's a lot of things that we have to take into consideration in options. And one of those is that we must live within our budget. We must live within what we have. I have people say, well, you know, we don't have a meeting house. We have to meet under a tree. Well, Lydia and her household were meeting and praying on a riverbank. So again, don't think that you have to spend thousands of dollars, which you do not have, to build a building that you do not need to try and impress people who probably could care less. Uh, and so we have to be careful with, again, how we handle the church. I believe that we can, within this framework, understand that a small congregation just started would want to establish a goal of reaching the lost and building up the church, and that someday they may rent or buy their own meeting house. But today is not that day, and you're no less a church of Christ than those who have the most expensive buildings and equipment. The buildings, the equipment, the aids, the options, the expedients do not make the church and may not necessarily make it as faithful to God as it could be. And so this is why I say that we need to spend some time thinking about how we use these and our expectations of the various congregations of the Lord's people. And so if we don't have the ability to do this, if we can't afford the aids, we can steal. I tell people that God gave us the worship of the church in a very simple format. We can worship God anywhere, anytime, without any of these aids, expedients, and optionals that we find in use today. We can sit on a riverbank, we can be under a tree, and we can sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. We can pray, we can teach and preach, we can find the grape juice and make the unleavened bread and take the Lord's Supper. We can take that out of a pie pan, we can take it however, we can use one glass or many glasses, but again, in its very simple way, the worship of God needs very little for us to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. So please, uh, if you get nothing else out of all of this, understand that there is no one set way in which the body of Christ meets and worships other than those five principles done in spirit and in truth, to sing, to pray, to teach, to have the Lord's Supper, and to partake of the communion. And however we do that without violating God's original commands, we are a faithful congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Again, we can meet in our homes, we can meet in a public place, we can buy a place, build a place. We need to understand that all of these things are options 
But again, by building a place, it may not be something that is wise or is a true expedient for that particular congregation. And we need to look at some other things. The Bible teaches us that we should teach. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, here's my question. Here's my question. Jesus said that after we've preached the gospel, after they've been baptized, once they become Christians, we're to teach them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded. They're told to teach, but God does not specifically tell us where and how to teach. Jesus gave commandments of what to teach, but not necessarily how to do that. So let's look at this. God wants his word taught to all. What are some of the options, expedients and, and that are given to us? Well, I can invite people into my home. I can open my house up to the church that is in that community. And as I've said, we can sit in my biggest room that's available or in the most comfortable spot available. And we can have our Bibles and we can open them up and we can teach. We may rent a building where people may come. Uh, we can supply Bibles and songbooks and the pews. Uh, we can build a church building where people can come and we can teach them. And they can always know that here on this date and on this day and this time, I can receive the teachings. Again, all age groups need to be taught. Small children need to be taught. Older children need to be taught. Teenagers need to be taught. Young adults need to be taught. Older adults need to be taught. Now, here's my question. How are we going to do that? The Bible just says that we're supposed to teach them to observe all things. Now, we can do that in the auditorium or in the living room all together. Or we may do that in a building. Providing we have enough individuals, we may actually have different rooms in the congregation where Bible classes are taught to the various age groups where the younger children are taught the simple Bible principles. The older children are taught a more complex. The teenagers in preparing them to obey the gospel need to know even deeper things. And adults need to know still yet other things. Now, whether we do that in the congregation whether parents take it upon themselves individually to teach their children, all of these are options. No one way is the right way. The Bible doesn't teach us that we have to have a church building. The Bible does not teach us that we have to have classrooms. The Bible teaches us that we are to teach them to observe all things whatsoever we're commanded. Therefore, no one can force us to have or not have Bible classes in a church building at specific times. 
These are options and we will use aids and expedients based on the congregation's size and ability to best meet the obligations that we have. So back to what Jesus said. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Don't make options commandments. Don't make expedients commandments. Don't make aids commandments, and most certainly do not take things that violate the law of God and make them commandments. And so, if we think about this, you know, a lot of times these ver this verse especially is used of the denominational world. But I think some of our own people are guilty of making commandments and making conditions of fellowship based on their opinions and not based on the commandments of men. No one should or can make an expedient aid or option a command of God. Only God can command specifically and generally or generically. Only God can command. Only the New Testament can give us the things that we need to do and teach us how to do them in a way that's faithful to God. And that's why, friends, we've had this class that we understand how to establish biblical authority for our beliefs and practices, and that we do not bind upon people things which God has not bound. God has given us a certain liberty in Christ, and we should not go beyond that to make laws and conditions where they do not exist, bind them and make them conditions of fellowship. Details of commands are left sometimes in the generic way to our best judgment. For example, here is just a list, but the time to assemble on the Lord's day for worship. Not in the scriptures, it is optional and we need to be careful when we do that, but we must meet on the Lord's day. The length of the sermon or sermon. Some people say, well, you know, I don't think a preacher ought to preach more than 30 minutes. Or someone else says, you know, if a preacher doesn't preach 45 minutes, I don't think he's doing his job. There's nothing in the scriptures that says how long or how short a sermon should be. How big of a congregation, how many Christians does it take to have a local congregation? Well, the only thing the scripture tells us is where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. One person uh, can praise God by themselves, but again, the congregation and to establish church really requires more than just one person. How many churches can we have in a city? Well, that would depend on how big the city is and what the best way in, to evangelize and meet our obligations in that city. Some cities, one congregation is fine. Other cities, 15 may not be enough. And so we can't bind that. How many times do we meet on the Lord's day? Some congregations meet only once. Some congregations meet uh, for two services, two services in the morning because they're so big, and they have another service in the evening. And again, some only have one service, and that's it. What should we wear to the worship? How should we dress? Well, the scriptures do not specifically tell us other than it should be done modestly in decorum and in a fitting way 
that does not expose ourselves to immoral practices or overglorify ourselves with gold and silver and braids. And how many elders or deacons does a congregation have? Uh, in the early test, in the early church, we find that uh, when the churches were first established, they didn't have elders or deacons. As the church grew, they appointed elders in every church and every city. And then as the need arose, they also ordained elders. The scriptures tell us that we have elders, plural, in every city, but whether a church has two elders or ten would depend on the size of the congregation and the need. And so again, we cannot bind uh, these things which are optional and left to our best means. And again, whether to rent, borrow, or buy a place of worship, and again, how the building should be furnished. Uh, some people say, again, uh, we shouldn't have stained glass windows. Other people say, I don't see anything wrong with it. Nothing in the Bible says anything about stained glass windows. So again, uh, as long as we're not making graven images and bowing down to them, uh, we have to be careful about these things. And so I think that we both see what there is as an advantage to expedients, aids, and optionals. But again, there are also dangers uh, to be avoided. To expect everyone to do things exactly the way we do it because that's the best way opens ourselves up to dangers which strain fellowship and have actually caused congregations to divide. And so Christians need to be taught not to base their concept or idea of faithfulness on matters of opinion. As we close up here this morning, we want to look at this chart again. And we have talked about the fact that there are universal commands that apply to the whole church. And there may be individual commands that apply to the elders, the deacons, and others. And these come in the form of generic and specific, that is general or specific, commands. We have to know the difference. If we have a generic command, we're left to our judgment on carrying that out in a way that does not violate the scriptures. Now, if we can find examples in the scriptures of how these things were carried out, then that gives us a more explicit, specific way in which to do it. And therefore, it moves even a generic command over into a more specific point. But if there are no examples and we have this specific command, then we are in a position where we can use expedience, aids, and optionals to fulfill that command, such as teaching, church building, songbook, PowerPoint, microphones, whatever is expedient and best. Specifically, uh, when we find that on the first day of the week, uh, every one of us are to lay by in store, that's an explicit uh, thing. And therefore, on the first day of the week, uh, we understand that we're to do that in a very specific time. Uh, and it is to be laid by in store for the purpose and use of the church. We're going to open it up to uh, comments, questions in a minute. I know we're going to be going a little bit longer today than usual. Brother Stanley has something also uh, to mention at the end here. Uh, again, next Monday, no live class. Go to the booklet and spend some time with Lesson 12 personally. And I encourage everyone, what you have learned in this class, if you're a preacher or a teacher, 
please help your congregation to understand these things. And again, if you haven't enrolled and are interested in getting the certificate of basic Bible, uh, of the basic Bible course, send your name, mailing address, and email to Christwaybible at gmail.com, and we'll get you signed up and where you need to be uh, for that first class on March the 6th. And again, you do not have to be registered to continue to watch the class. If you don't want the certificate, you just want the information, the certificate really doesn't matter. Feel free to tune in. Uh, we will be posting the uh, links as always so that everyone that wants to can join in the class. And again, March 6th, no class next Monday. Prepare for March 6th. Get your downloads, get your course material. Uh, make sure you have your Bible, notebook, all of that ready uh, for the class. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Most kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace. We're thankful, Father, for your many blessings. You watch care over us for the gift of your son, Jesus, on the cross of Calvary, for the work of the Holy Spirit that has given us your inspired word. We pray, Father, in studying biblical authority and trying to understand how to properly establish our beliefs and practices. We just pray, Father, that we might be faithful to you, that we might live, love, and serve you in a way that when this life is over, heaven can be our home. We pray, Father, that you be with the sick, the afflicted, the hurting. We just pray, Father, that you will look down upon them in mercy, have grace upon them, find a means and a way to relieve that. Be with us through this week until next time we meet on March the 6th, Father. Keep us safe and in your blessings we pray. In Jesus' name, and amen. In closing this evening. We wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.